evacuating everyone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so today I'm going to start off with a training on how to create a practice routine. I know when I first started playing guitar, I had no idea how to practice. Usually it went, I tried to uh, learn a song or something, usually way over my head, and I just sit down for some period of time and butcher it. Right. Over time, I got some lessons and, you know, got to where the teacher would kind of say, here's what you need to practice. And, you know, I mostly do what the teacher said, but I would often have this kind of grumbling in my mind that, you know, that's not really what I want to learn. That's, uh, I, I want to do this over here and I don't see how this getting me there. And of course, the teacher would say, well, you really need to do this and this first before you go on to that. And, you know, that happened for years. Finally, I got to a place where I realized over time that I'm the one, only one responsible for my guitar progress. Mm -hmm. And that means I need to like take charge of both, you know, what I'm learning as well as what I'm practicing. Practice is a key. When you practice, your fingers and your mind get used to doing something. Mm -hmm. But I want to practice things that are going to get me where I want to go. Yeah. And I do need teachers and other systems to help me know specifically how to practice, what, how to break it down and what to practice to get better. Right. But when I took charge of my own practice sessions, my progress just went through the roof. As a matter of fact, I made more progress that year, I remember, than I did in the first four or five years That's of great. learning guitar. Now, before this, I want to explain to you what I call a three-step practice routine. Basically, create a plan, organize that plan into actionable steps, mm -hmm. and then kind of uh, evaluate what you've done, reflect on it, and use that information for your next practice session and for practice sessions in the future. Right. But before you do that, there's something I consider more important. That's to take some time to sit down and think about where you want to go and what it'll take to get you there. Yeah. So. I would get out a piece of paper for at least the first time you did this, and preferably, you know, every once in a while. Think about what, what does it look like when I'm where I want to get to. If you see yourself playing in church, playing in a congregation, write that down. If you see yourself playing at campfire with your friends singing along, <laughs> that sounds like fun, even right now I'm thinking about it. Or how about playing happy birthday to your sweetheart, or, or sitting at the beach by yourself and making up songs. I, I love doing that myself. Or jamming with your friends, maybe a, a, we call weekend warrior, the mm -hmm. hang out with your friends on the weekend and, and in a little um, band, so to speak. Uh, or if you have aspirations to be a professional, play in nightclubs, uh, in a, a coffee shop at, uh, what do you call those? Open mics, mm -hmm. you know, where you can kind of sit in. Write that down. And it doesn't have to be one thing. And Think about now what, try to be realistic, what are your weaknesses and strengths compared to your goals? Right. What I want you to focus on is to take your strengths, let's say you can play some chords, but you're not so good at changing between one and the other. Take those strengths and keep working to make them your super strengths. Mm -hmm. Take the weaknesses and evaluate if those weaknesses are applicable to where you want to get to. Pick the weaknesses that are and improve on those. Mm -hmm. Don't try to improve on everything that you come across uh, with guitar. And you have to come across a variety of things to know, to have stuff to narrow it down to what you want to do. So you are going to come across a variety of techniques, lessons, exercises, songs maybe. But narrow down what you can't do to things that are specific to your goal. Now also take into account how much you're willing or can practice. Mm -hmm. Maybe for me right now, um, I can practice five days a week. Some people can practice seven days a week. Um, I have some commitments that five days is, is a good stretch for me. Maybe because of your job or your family, you can practice three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But take that into account um, and try to be realistic also with the amount of time that you practice. Uh, by the way, uh, and I'll talk more about this, I recommend try to set a minimum practice time, not a maximum, so that you have a chance to get started and be successful or feel successful in your practice session, not always fall short or often fall short of the amount of time you set. Then, with all that in mind, sit down and write out some practice sessions or what you're going to practice. Try to choose maybe a week period of time mm -hmm. and write down a practice session for each day of that week. And it doesn't have to be, and I won't even recommend it's the same thing every day. 
maybe pick, uh, because you have too many things that you want to learn to all do it all in one day. And that means maybe Monday, Wednesday, and Friday practice a session, and then Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday practice a little different session. Um, you can even practice something every other day that you're working on. You, you have to use some judgment, and you get some more experience as you do this. Now, with that as a foundation, I want to give you the three steps to actually creating your own practice routine. First step, start with a plan. So you have a foundation for start with a plan now. Mm -hmm. You have an idea of where you want to go and what it takes to get there. And it's, it's fluid. This is, you're going to get more information and it's going to evolve and change. But start from somewhere. Now, when you create a plan, organize it. Well, start with what you're going to practice. When you sit down to practice, don't just practice anything that comes to mind. Decide what you're going to practice ahead yeah. of time. Decide what you want to get better on. Look at your plan. Decide which ones. You want to narrow it down to a few short-term goals and decide which of those short-term goals you want to work on first. And that practice session will be the first step on that short-term goal. That's what you're going to work on today right, right. before you sit down. Now, step two is organize into an actionable plan. Mm -hmm. Three steps to that plan. First, warm up. Choose something to get your hands working with your mind. Something that you can do, not something you have to struggle with or you just learned. Yeah. Get a practice exercise, you know, learn it. The first or two or three times it might be a little awkward, but keep doing it over and over so it becomes something that you can do without thinking too hard, but works between your mind and your hand to get things coordinated. Then go into what I call your improvement mode. This is the area of what you're going to work on. So the body of your practice session, the larger part, is that session. So for example, if this is just an off-the-top-of-my-head example, you want to play and sing in a coffee shop. Well, you can play some chords so you know that you have some strength there and probably enough folk chords to be able to even do that now, but your transitions between chords is weak. So for that practice session, I'm going to work on transitioning between a certain number of chords, maybe chords in a certain key, so I can play some songs that sound good in that key. Mm -hmm. You'll expand later to other keys. So that's an example of something to practice on. If you're working on, you want to play fingerstyle, well, you're going you're gonna to make the body of your uh, practice session for that first one something to do with fingerstyle guitar, depending on your level and where you're at. Now, the third step is to close up. I'll call this, you know, something you'll play for fun or something fairly easy that you can leave with a feeling of success. You want to close up with something that you walked away feeling like, yeah, I can do something. Not, you know, you're still struggling with that last piece and you walk away and that's all you remember is what you were struggling with. Mm -hmm. So now you have three areas. You want to divide that into small, big, and small. Warm up, let's say you have 10 minutes, a couple minutes. Then the body of your practice, maybe six, seven minutes, the body, and then just a minute or two on that last part. If you only have 10 minutes, that would work. Of course, if you have 20 minutes, double all that. Right. Uh, 30 minutes, triple all that. Now, you've got a organization to your practice, and you can keep creating that uh, groove, so to speak, in each of your practice sessions. Finally, the third step is to look at what you're doing to uh, reflect on how that practice session went. And I'm talking just a couple of minutes. Don't make this a you know, half an hour long reflection. And then integrate that into your routine. Mm -hmm. So you're going to think about what you didn't do so well that practice session, what needs to be improved, yeah. what went well. Where are the opportunities that I can integrate into my next practice session? Which the feedback that I just got from this practice session, how can I bring that over into tomorrow's practice session or two days from now, whenever the next session is? Right. And I'd encourage you at first to maybe even write that down. As you get better at it, you won't need the paper so much, but writing it down is a great way to actually keep track of and to see what you're doing and to develop that habit of doing it. When you have something concrete, it's easier to keep doing it. Just in your mind, it's kind of fuzzy. So those are the three steps. Start with a plan, think about what you're going to practice before you sit down, divide it into three sections, do the warm-up, the body of what you're going to work on, and then end with something fun, enjoyable. Finally, take a few minutes and reflect on what you did, integrate it into your next practice sessions, mm -hmm. maybe several practice sessions in the future. 
So a couple more tips. I mentioned that I. I really encourage students to set a minimum amount of practice time as opposed to saying when I practice, I heard this over and over, I'm gonna practice an hour a day. An hour seems to be a <laughs> one people can grab onto an hour yeah. a day. They don't do that, and then they feel bad about it. Yep. Or in my case, I'll say I'm gonna practice for an hour. I my day's busy, I have 30 minutes, that's not an hour. Why even get started? I, I can't do my whole practice session. Yeah. No practice that day. Mm -mm. In the toilet. <laughs> Set a minimum amount of practice time. Yeah. I'll say to myself, hey, I, I'm just going to practice, for me, 25 minutes a day. I would suggest start with 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes. You do that 10 minutes, you're sitting down, you're into it, you, got, you don't have to rush out the door. Hey, 10 turns to 20, turns to 30, you're having a good time. Yeah. What the heck? But even if you can only do that 10 minutes, you're more likely to squeeze it in your day and you're going to say you got your practice, you feel good about it. That engenders more practice, yeah. more progress. We're looking to keep treating this mind in a way that you're um, feeling motivated and encouraged. And you can't always stay there, but you keep coming back at it. I, I learned a lot of this in dog training, you know. I used to, like, <laughs> get mad at my dog when they do something right. Yeah. And I think of my mind, it's a little bit like that. When I punish it for not doing something right, the mind remembers the bad feeling. Mm -hmm. And then doesn't want to come back at it later. And yeah. at first it's very subtle, but it starts snowballing. The same with the dog. When I, when I get mad at him or punish him or yell at him because he didn't do something right, now he doesn't even want to do the practicing. Yeah. You know, he, he just avoids it altogether. Yeah. When I reward him for every little thing, feeling good, he wants to do more. And he, right. he learns faster. Yeah. So, yeah, my mind's like a dog. I, everybody knew that. I just finally admitted it. <laughs> um, I recommend also getting a set place to practice. And it could be anywhere, but try to go for some place that's reasonably distraction-free. There's no perfect in this world, not for most busy people anyway. Yeah. And have your stuff set up so that it makes it really easy to get going. You, know, you have your picks, your tuner, your metronome, whatever it is, maybe your computer. I like to, I like to record stuff on the computer. Mm -hmm. And that way when you sit down over time, you kind of just get in the mood because it becomes a habit. Yeah. Kind of like brushing your teeth in the morning. You, you get into the bathroom, you see the toothbrush, you, your hand can just go there. It just knows what to do. Yeah. You don't have to think about it. And when you sit down to practice after a while, you just start practicing. You feel like practicing. Mm -hmm. And maybe the last tip, I would encourage you to, um, what is that last tip? You don't have to practice the same thing every day. And that's a mistake I used to make in the beginning. I have to get this until I can move on. No, it doesn't work that way. First of all, break things into small steps so you can get them and not have to practice it for months and months before it can sound decent. But also, kind of rotate things. Work on something for this period of time, then work on something else and integrate that in your practice. When you think about your practice sessions, you can do that. If you just sit down with no plan in mind, you kind of just default to what you worked on yesterday or whatever comes to your mind. Think of any other tips you can add? I can. Um, one thing that I think is important to recognize, especially with like guitar, ukulele, the really physical instruments. I mean, really kind of like all instruments are, but you know, this uses your body. Um, so you really have to focus on being able to make a good mind-body connection. Uh, like your brain and your hand have to be on the same page. Uh, and I'd say that that's like, for me personally, a huge part of training um, and practicing. And I've found it to be more successful to do small bouts several times a week versus one big fat practice session a week. That's a good point. So, you know, I don't necessarily want to do an hour and a half on Saturdays because throughout the week I haven't done anything to help prepare me for that. And now I'm sitting here for an hour and a half getting frustrated because my hands kind of don't know what they're doing because I haven't been working on that connection throughout the week. So instead of an hour and a half a week, if you have 15 minutes, four days a week, start with that. Um, I love what you said about kind that's of like idea. setting a minimum time too. I mm -hmm. think that's a really smart way to do it because it's really easy to like, well, I'm trying to practice for an hour and I don't have an hour, so. I find I almost always go over my minimum, but yeah. at the bare minimum, I feel good about having done it. Right, right. And I think that that's definitely like a good place to be when you're practicing. Um, and there was one other thing. Um, 
I do think it's really important to like when you're closing up play something that you know that you enjoy because you know for those of you that are like practicing and you're new at this you will definitely have frustrating practice sessions that's part of how learning music works it's just that's just how it is um, and so it's really nice to kind of like end on a note of like, oh, that's cool. And I actually heard a suggestion from one of our teachers here, Sebastian, who'd mentioned uh -huh. um, recording some of your sessions and then looking back at them, you know, that's like later idea. on. So totally, like, let's say you're starting a song, right? Record the first time that you're learning it and the first time you play it all the way through. And then one of your practice sessions three months from then, maybe close up that session with, with playing that song and listening to your recording. And you can see how much progress you've made. And it may be something small like going from you know C to G is all of a sudden a little bit smoother instead of taking five seconds, it took you two. That's still improvement. Um, and so it's important to be patient with yourself and just allow that process to happen. And like I tell people all the time, just enjoy your journey of learning. You know, there's just like, you may have a goal and destination in sight, and I think that's great, and you should keep that, but just enjoy the process. Go through the motions of like learning music because that's really where the joy and the passion comes from. I, we were talking about this earlier before we started recording. It's really important not to always focus on what you can't do. Yeah. Because no matter how good you get, you'll always feel less than. Mm -hmm. And this is something I'm guilty of, quite frankly. I have to come back at it over and over. Yeah, play something I can play at the end of practice session. I say that, but I don't always do that. And I have to keep reminding myself and kind of get back in the habit of doing that. And then I fall out and I get back into it. Also, uh, try to break things small enough that you can get them. I see a lot of students that tackle something that's just way over their head. And no matter how much they practice, they're not going to get it to where it really sounds good. And that can be kind of debilitating over time. Yeah, it can be. And I can tell you as a teacher, I sometimes have those students that come in, they're like, this is the song I'm going to play in three months at the thing. And I tell them, OK, but be prepared that, first of all, we're probably going to do a simple version. And second of all, like, just be prepared for the work that's going to take to put in for it. And, you know, if you're not ready for it, you're not ready for it. And that's okay, because you will be ready for it if you can get through some of the easier stuff. Um, and that's actually a perfect segue into a live question, SR. I don't know what your real name is, but your YouTube name is SR. So, hey, SR. Um, says, how not to get bored when learning a hard song or doing practice? Um, and I have a tip on that. Okay, let's hear it. So my first thing is, if you're getting bored learning a hard song, it's probably too hard for you. Let's start with that. If you're like learning a hard song and you're just like, this is boring, it's probably because you're not, you're not ready for it yet. So you're like, you kind of don't even know where to start. And I've totally, totally been there before. So my tip is to take a step back and focus on one section. Focus on one lick, focus on three chords that are in there and work on going between those three chords. Just that you get the feeling and the satisfaction of like, I'm working on this song and it'll help you down the line in other things as well. Um, so that would be my first tip. And really, I would highly encourage you to kind of reevaluate the song that you're playing. Listen to some of the stuff. And if it sounds like it's something that's just out of your league, maybe start with a simple version or, like I said, just a really small section of it. Just because if you're taking an entire song and you're bored with it and it's too hard, it's not going to work. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me. I don't know if I can improve on that. Yeah. I know I used to, when I first started teaching, this was 20. Five, no, 35 years ago, I'd have a lot of students that would want me to teach them a song right away that was way over their head. Yeah. And it was always awkward for me because as a teacher, I don't want to discourage them and uh, I'd want them to feel frustrated with me and blame it on me. But at the same time, I know that they're going to get discouraged trying to play something that they're not ready for. And there are many things that they could enjoy and feel successful at that would right. be on the way to getting there. Right. And the second thing is often when you try to play something technically that's um, a big leap, you'll strain and, and struggle to get there. Yeah. And that tension actually causes more problem in the long run. Yeah. So I'm constantly looking for students to try to break or release that tension. Yeah. That's something I encourage you in your practice session. If you're getting really tense about something, stop, shake it out. You know, decide if this is maybe you're, you've taken something that's a little too hard. If not, just, you know, relax and come back at it. Break it down a little bit more, like you said. Right. And I think also, and this kind of touches on the second part of the question for you, SR, um, about, like, getting bored doing practice. I think that there's a difference between wanting to be able to play a song or two on the guitar and being able to play the guitar, right? There are some people that walk into learning guitar with the understanding of, like, I'm literally doing this to be able to play this song. And some people are like, yeah. I want to learn guitar as an instrument. Get clear on what your goal is. Because if your goal is to just learn that specific song, then don't get bored. <laughs> 
Keep, you know, take whatever steps you need to take to get to that song. If your goal is to actually learn guitar, then take a step back and really think about what kind of journey. Um, Eli, do you have any tips on this? Because I know you play guitar too. Make sure your mic is on too. Um, in terms, not really on this, but more on like if something's giving you trouble, um, I'd say consistency is definitely a big thing mm -hmm. because just building those, those mental pathways, you know, and getting your fingers familiar. Like I notice a huge difference when I... Um, practice something even if you take you know a day in between or something like that it's totally fine but the next time you come back to it it's so much easier just having processed it and being able to you know yeah have your mind really process it so yeah that's a good point and i i totally want to mention i think that we had a seamless transition but normally felix is on the mic this is eli he's another one of our awesome team members so for those of you that are like that's not felix it's not it's eli <laughs> So I know uh, Shulamit had uh, some questions. The first yes. question, it's uh, related to the uh, creating a practice routine. Right, yeah, so Shulamit um, has like several parts of a question. So we'll just, everything that you're about to hear is all from Shulamit. So first question is, if there are different areas that I want to learn, for example, fing um, finger picking and improvisation, and maybe also strumming patterns, should I concentrate on one area and only practice it so I master it? Should I spend some time on each? Um, on each area, even though it'll make make it much longer to master each individual skill. So great question, and ties into just what I was talking about. Now I'm going to recommend. There's no first of all, there's no one right way to do this, and and you are an individual person. Everybody is. You need to take into account uh, your learning and how quickly you learn something. For me, I'll usually pick a few areas. And then I'll organize my practice sessions and not work on one, I'll work on one area a day. And then the next day I'll work on a different area and that will be my focus. Mm -hmm. I won't choose five or six areas, that's usually too much. I'll make some progress on two, maybe three areas for a period of time. And then I'll reevaluate and decide if I've got enough on those areas for now and come to another area. Of course, I want to learn everything. And I go to a concert and all of a sudden I see this guy play. Now I want to learn that. And I never even thought of that before. That happened recently. Yeah. <laughs> this is some uh, thumb picking stuff. That's cool. But I also know that uh, often these distractions can lead to frustration in the future because mm -hmm. I realize now I've dropped something that was important to me and I didn't really complete, I didn't get to a place where I felt like I got enough progress on that one area. Right. So choose, I'd say two to start with, you can always add, go small, choose two areas and then stagger your practice. One day make this your focus, the next day make this your focus and do that every other day for some set period of time, I'd say maybe for a month or two, right. and then reevaluate and decide if you want to do more on that, take it up a notch, or add something else, push something out. Maybe you can do three different sections, different things. Yeah. It is a kind of a way of, you need to kind of think things out. That's, it doesn't work if you just sit down to practice and just decide what to practice that minute. Yeah. You, you need to kind of look things over, evaluate, and come back at it again. Exactly. And this, and honestly, that's, I think that's where teach, having a teacher comes in handy because your teacher is able to say, okay, based on what I know, based on how you play, I think you're ready to do this. I think you're ready to do that. Like I know personally, um, cause on Ook, you know, we'll do a little bit of everything, a little strumming, a little finger picking, a little theory stuff. Um, and I sprinkle it in depending on the song that the student's learning. And then I have certain songs that I know that like, okay, if the student's gotten to this point, this is the song that we'll do, or a song that they like that's kind of related and I can find a, a, a lesson in there. Um, and that's when we'll start introducing things. So I think it's okay to work on more than one thing at a time, but I do also think that it depends on what your goal is. And if your goal is to finish this one song and it has all finger picking and strumming and going between the two, then that's what you need to work on. Um, so it just kind of depends on what, what the bigger picture is. Let's see the next question. Yeah, next question. And thank you all for your patience. I know I've, I'm seeing your comments that the camera was fuzzy, but it looks like the focus has gone back into place. So thanks for keeping an eye on that. Uh, number two is, is it best to only practice set exercises till I master the technique, or should I practice them in songs I like, even though I haven't quite gotten it down pat? Hmm. I would say there's room for both. And I think it's important to practice something, and even before you get perfect at it, try to apply it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I yeah. really learned this when I was learning to speak Spanish. Yeah. If I just studied something over and over, when I actually came to apply it, there was such a big gap between yeah. using it. But at the same time, 
keep going back in your workshop and working on whatever it is so that you can apply it, kind of get, not get it up a notch and a level. So they, they work together back and forth. Exactly. Um, I agree completely with that. I think that it's, it is important to do both. I would actually recommend you do both, um, primarily so that you don't get bored. I mean, you know, it's like if, if you're wanting to learn how to do finger style and you have a finger style song in mind that you want to do, you know, while you're learning how to do it, go ahead and apply it. Because you can have the knowledge all you want, but if you can't apply it, it's not going to benefit you in any way. So, um, so that's something to think about. And there's actually a really great book that may be a little hard for where you are, but it may not be. It's called Guitar Aerobics, and I used the ukulele aerobics one. It's by Hal Leonard, and um, I can grab a copy of it in a moment and kind of show it to you guys. But it's a really good one that kind of does tap on a whole bunch of different areas. So it has little finger style stuff. So what I do with some of my students is like, I'll have them do the finger style section. We'll do a little bit of that. And then I'm like, okay, we did it here. Now let's apply it to this chord progression or let's apply it to this song. So, I think so that's a good both. point. It's a combination of application and exercises, application and exercises, exactly. back and forth. Exactly, and do both, do both for sure. Next question from Shulamit. Um, where does theory fit into the practice scheme? If I learn some theory, how will I know to apply it uh, in playing songs? My experience with theory was I was taught in the university and often um, it was up to me to apply it and, and it didn't, it wasn't applicable right away. I saw it kind of filter in. Um, I try as a teacher to point out where the application is, mm -hmm. but it's never 100%. I mean, right. it's because when you're learning theory, it can apply to a lot of things and you just can't <laughs> make that leap right away. But yeah. as you continue to progress, you start seeing and looking back and seeing how that theory has helped. I would say keep theory a small part of your learning. For me, you don't have to learn theory, so to speak. Theory is just some way of explaining why things work the way they do. But especially for adults, we like to engage our minds. And if you can, sometimes that makes things both more interesting and gets you more into it, gets you more engaged, and you can kind of learn it in a little, in a deeper sense. Yeah, I agree. Theory is not really my strong suit. We were actually just talking about this before live, um, but it's an important thing. It's good to know how to do, for sure. Also for guitar, there are some things in theory that are more applicable and some things that are not. Um, as, as a member of Real Guitar Success Academy, I only include theory things that I think will be directly applicable, not kind of college level or uh, uh, ivory tower type theory. Though yeah. sometimes it is interesting and sometimes even people ask for that kind of thing. But I try to stick to when I'm actually cr spend time creating a lesson, something that I know will be applicable to playing guitar. Yeah, for sure. Um, and actually, Shulamit has a few more questions we're going to get to, but I do have a live question that fits in perfectly with Shulamit's following question, so I'm going to throw that in there. And this is from Daisy One. Daisy One says, I want to learn how Daisy to read one. music. Is there a Daisy Two? <laughs> Maybe. No. I want to learn how to read music and have a beginner guitar book on this. Should I learn how to read music and play guitar at the same time, or should this be done as separate things? Um, I, well, first of all, I think if you're going to learn to read music, applying it to an instrument is, I'd say, a must. Yeah. It's like learning to talk, but not you know, without talking to anybody. How are you going to get good at it? This doesn't work. Reading music, is the purpose of it is to play or sing. Yeah. And it's a communication device between people. Hey, I got this great song in my head. I'm going to write it down so somebody else can play it. That's what it's all about. Right. I, it it kind of depends on why you want to read music. It's just an intellectual study. I still suggest, you know, directly applying it using the guitar to read. In other words, learn to read a few notes on the guitar and then add and add and add, play songs, expand on that step by step. Yeah. It's, it's going to be more fun, first of all, and it's going to stick much more. Um, piano is, if you just want to read music, the piano is an easier instrument to learn to read on. It mm -hmm. makes more sense yes, in terms of how the notes are laid out on the piano. Yeah. Um, but I would, if, if I knew you, uh, I would ask why you want to learn to read music. If it's to play guitar, that's a different story, and I don't think that's the, the best route to read music to play guitar. And I've had a lot of students ask that, that's why I know that's a possibility. Yeah. Hey, I gotta learn to read music first because I wanna play guitar. No, yeah. that's, that's not a good uh, order of things. Yeah, and SR actually says, 
Um, I learned to read music sheet, but later found it's not much useful when it comes to guitar. Guitar tab reading is easy and kind of easy to get into. Um, if it's for guitar, I definitely recommend tab to start. I read music and I do use reading music, but I'm talking in the early stages, just the best bang for your buck is to learn to read tab. I agree. Um, and so this is, this is my kind of like two cents on this. I faked being able to read music for a few years <laughs> because I had a good ear and I could just make it work. And, so I, and then I got called out on it, and then at that point I was like, okay, I guess I need to get a little bit more serious about being able to do this. Now I can read perfectly fine. It's, it's easy for me. Um, in fact, easier than tab sometimes. My thing is, though, you really don't need to know how to read music to play music, and I think that's really clear, and you've made that really clear. Um, I highly recommend starting with tab in the way that I personally teach it. That seems to make sense for folks who've never done music before, particularly adults. I teach them how to read tab first so they understand it, and then I teach people how to read music so that they can relate the tabulature to reading music. And for those of you that don't know, the way I describe tab is it's a cheat code for telling you where to play notes. It tells you where to put your fingers on the strings. Um, and the notes tell you the same thing, but there's a bunch of other factors involved. So I highly recommend if you, if you really are going down the route of like, I wanna know how to read music because it's something I wanna know how to do. In addition to playing guitar, start with tab and then you can learn how to relate the two. And that's probably gonna be the easiest way if you're teaching yourself. And the one exception to that is if you're really hell-bent on playing classical guitar. Yeah. When I say classical guitar, I specifically mean the classical type literature, not just finger-picking guitar. Right. Because right. The, the, all the literature for classical guitar involves reading notes. So mm -hmm. it's traditional to start reading notes from the beginning. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so we're going to go back now to Shulamit has a couple more questions pre-submitted. So what progression of skills is recommended? Where do I progress after learning the beginner's course? Oh, she's talking specifically to the Real Guitar Success Academy. Mm -hmm. So there's a uh, beginner's journey that's sort of the basics of playing guitar. And then from there, you can branch off into different directions. And this depends on what you want to focus on. My, one of the universal things is the uh, bar chords, because you're going to need them in pretty well every style of music. So a, you can't go wrong if you go right into the bar chord course. It's called Bar Chords for Everyone. And the bar chord course is more than just bar chords. Yes, I'm giving you a step-by-step -step system to comfortably and, and easily play bar chords. So you, mm -hmm. you can really move around the neck, not just kind of know them, which makes them not very useful. But all the way in there, I integrate some different strums, some theory, how, how to apply these, how to use, how am I say this? How to see keys of songs and how to change keys easily using patterns on uh, specifically are related to bar chords. So there's a lot more to it along the way there. But if you want to learn finger picking, I'd really, uh, if that's a focus, I would really go into the finger picking series mm -hmm. and I would learn the beginning, go right from there into uh, what I call Spanish guitar. I'll relabel it because it should say like level two because it's kind of taking the beginning techniques and expanding on them to more solo style playing. And then there's a third on finger picking patterns that I really strongly recommend. Mm -hmm. And the finger picking patterns, some of them are may not be easy, but with the foundation, they'll be doable and within a reasonable stretch. Yeah. Definitely. I think that's great. Um, Shulamit shifted the game a little bit here. It says, now something for Ami concerning the ukulele. Um, since there aren't real bass notes, I understand that the chords are mainly inversions. Are the chords always played from the G string, even though often it's not the bass note? So that's a double, that's a several part question. Let me grab my uke real quick. So um, when we're looking at the ukulele, yes, you are correct in, in saying that like the G string is right here on the uke. So it's the very top string. And that's a little bit different from guitar because on the guitar, your top string closest to your face is the lowest note, right? Um, here it goes, our lowest note is actually our third string. Um, so the thing is this, first of all, you can always add what's called a low G string on the ukulele. So instead of this being at this, it'll be an octave lower. So it'll go bum, 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 bum. So you can actually have G be the lowest note. Um, if you're talking like finger style, uh, I will typically actually go from the C uh, string in, instead of here, or sometimes like, sometimes like a thumb alternating thing. If you're talking about strumming, um, the chord's always played from the G string, even though it's not the bass note. No, because sometimes I play them from here, and sometimes I strum up, what gives it a totally different feel. It depends on the song, depends on the sound that you're trying to create. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I, I think I saw you live. So if you have a follow-up on that, just put it in the chat and I'll get back to it. 
Um, the second thing was after learning the basic chords and strumming, which is just about the same as guitar, where should I go from there? Ah, still talking about uke. Just talking about uke. Well, the world is your oyster. You can kind of go wherever you want to go. Uh, what do I do with my students normally is... Um, I want to play flamenco uke. Yeah, it's possible. You can do it. You have to teach me, though. <laughs> uh, so the thing is, uh, with you, this is kind of where I normally teach my students. I start them with some melodic stuff, so simple melodies, right? Like, I typically use a book, and we'll go through some simple melodies using tab. Then we'll do some chord stuff, right? Because you got to learn how to do some chords. My tip for you, Shulamit, is to now combine the two. So now start trying to put some chords and melodies together um, so that you're playing the melody and the chord at the same time, which is its own method and technique in itself. And I have a whole, that could be an entire lesson of teaching someone how to do that. So my tip is to, rec I would recommend just play around with that a little bit. See what you can do to integrate the two. Um, and finger style on Ook is really fun. Being able to do some cool finger patterns. I just saw patterns. somebody doing that, yeah. Yeah, so you can get into some cool finger picking patterns, even with just chords that you know and you can do kind of different versions of songs that you like. And lastly, build a, re build a repertoire. Okay. That, that would definitely be the, the next step, is just learn a bunch of songs, why not? Just to be able to have them, and you can so portable, you can throw it on your back and go hang out with your friends, and if you know five or six songs, then you have a, a whole thing just planned right then and there. Okay, thank you, Shulamit, for all of your questions. Those were really great. Uh, we have another pre-submitted question from Tom Snyder, who I know is live. Hi, Tom. Hey, Tom. I haven't um, seen you in a while. Yeah. So Tom says, do you have any tips for helping to make a finger picking pattern, quote, automatic in addition um, to doing it over and over? <laughs> yes. Uh, boy, I can relate to that, Tom. Me too. Um, so I don't want to discount doing it over and over, but there are some tips. Uh, one is uh, make a practice routine for the finger. Yeah. Pick some uh, pattern and integrate your practice every other day. I wouldn't do it every day, but that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of people who had come to me for finger picking patterns, they were trying to do something that they needed to back up and do a simpler pattern yeah. because they were tensing. And the main thing that makes a pattern sound choppy is the tensing your fingers. Mm -hmm. So they weren't ready to do it, and they weren't ready to do it that fast, and they're tensing to try and compensate, and that's actually holding them back. Reminds me of that Chinese game where you put your fingers finger in this trap. thing, and then you the harder you pull, the more it sucks down on your fingers. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it feels like to me, is the harder you try, the more you tense, and the harder it is to actually do it and do it smoothly. So consider doing some basic patterns and getting those fast and applying that feeling of relaxation to more complex patterns. Yeah. Do it consistently in small periods and plan on keep coming back on it. Treat it as a developmental process, not I'm going to get this today and that's done, deal. Yeah. Spread it out, relax, because that's the point, is you got to get yourself to relax when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Any other tips? Yes and no. I mean, for me, finger picking has always been a struggle. Like that's, most musical things come easily to me, but that's one that I can honestly say that's like, it took me a while to feel comfortable doing it, and even then it's still challenging. Um, what I have to do is I can't think about it while I play it. Uh, yes, and by yeah. that, what I mean is just like, so if I'm, if I'm doing this pattern, if I start thinking too hard, or that's a better one, because my thumb has to alternate. If I, if I think about it too hard, it's really hard for me to get out of it. My recommendation is to say what you're playing. Um, so my drum teacher used to tell me, say it loud and play it slow. So if you're like thumb, pointer, thumb, middle, thumb, pointer, thumb, middle. And you start with that and then the repetition. I mean, that's kind of no getting around the repetition. Um, you may find it a little bit easier. And then I agree, you just have to relax. One thing that I do with my students, I make them talk to me while they play it. So like I'll literally be like, tell me about your day today. Well, I woke up, I went your to and school your <laughs> and then I'm like, nope, let's start again. What's your favorite color? So starting like doing that is a good way to get your mind off of it and just let your, your body go. Yeah. Um, we have a live question from Devil Boy. Hello, Devil Boy. Devil Boy? Yeah. Devil Boy says, I am a beginner and can play open chords and bar chords in low tempo, but I feel like I've been this way for about a year now. I specifically select songs to practice 
and learn, but I feel like I'm stuck. I, I used to get a lot of students that way, and one of the biggest issues is they can't transition between chords smoothly. Usually they, it was, it's more, hmm. they would learn a lot of chords, but they didn't really integrate those chords into actually playability. Uh, and I'm not positive that that's where you're at, but it's likely if in the first year you've learned bar chords and other chords. I would go back and do exercise specifically for transitioning. Mm -hmm. And that's the other issue. It's just learning songs is a, is a tough way to really get better. It's almost guaranteed you're going to get stuck. Right. You need to integrate songs in some kind of routine practice along with exercises that are specifically working on something that you need to work on. Mm -hmm. If it's transitions, get some exercises that are working on transitions specifically on some part of the chords you know not try all the right, chords right. and get better at those and then add other chords and other transitions yeah then apply that to some songs that use those chords and those transitions yeah so i take a step back in a sense get some exercises and keep that cycle going as you can play some simple songs cleanly and smoothly start adding some other songs that you know take it up a notch yeah, I agree. I think this also touches on what I said before. You kind of have to figure out, are you, are you, do you want to learn how to play guitar or do you want to learn how to play a couple of songs on the guitar? Because those are kind of two different methods. And um, I definitely recommend don't discount like how important exercises are in terms of learning. Because if you just go into learning music trying to learn songs, you're going to get yourself frustrated. I was brought up with the idea exercises are boring. That you know, I shouldn't have to do exercise. That's why I took guitar. Hey, that's what mm -hmm. piano students have to do. Mm. But, you know, I see it very clearly now. And exercise is a way of isolating something that you need to work on and, and doing it very efficiently in a short exactly. amount of time, getting a lot of repetitions and enough focus on it so you can see if you're tensing or if you're, if you're making correct, if you need to make corrections, you can do that. When you do a whole song, there's too much stuff going on to do all of that, to get the repetition specifically on what you need to work on and to, to remember the corrections you need to make and to slow down if you need to, all those things. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Good question. Um, and I have one more pre-submitted question. Just before I ask this, I just want to do like a last call for questions. If you guys have any other questions, please put them in the chat now so we can get to them after this one. Uh, so this last one pre-submitted is from Richard. Richard says, what is the best way to record your guitar playing at home? I'd like to get a decent recording that I could save and look back on to see my progress. Good thing there. Uh, I may want to share a video from time to time with the Real Guitar Success community. So Richard, I knew this was coming and Richard told me that I'm the one that inspired him to, to look into recording his sessions because I recommend that for all students. I, I think it's fun. It gives you kind of something, uh, another kind of way of coming back at what you're working on. You know, the recording aspect makes it a little interesting, adds some variety to your practice. But also, you can go back like you described, a month, two months, look at what you did, realize how much you've progressed, gives you a shot of adrenaline and gets you going. Uh, I, I think it's wonderful. And if you can share that once in a while with other people, that just gives you another aspect to make it more interesting and fun, get some feedback, some thumbs up, you did a good job. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple ways to go about this. Um, first of all, I'll start with the simplest way is to just use your phone. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend use the video function on your phone. Why? It's just as easy to take a video of your playing as it is to just do an audio. So why not? Yeah. And I will do that still to this day. It's, the phone has a, a benefit of being handy, always with me. I don't have to search for something. I don't have to have something set up and can only do it in that one area. Right. And I can store it easily on my phone too. Now, I, I, I don't store everything on my phone. I eventually take them off, but I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. It's there. It's on my phone, and I can take it off when I want to. It's not, I'm not going to lose it. Uh, the video I like because sometimes I'll look at the video and I'll see I was doing something that I forgot how I was doing it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think it's really helpful. Definitely. Now, the, video, the audio quality is not great. Um, seems to be getting better all the time, but there's a way to improve that. You can buy a little device. There's a, many on the market. Um, iRig is a famous brand for this. Uh, Zoom makes a, something called a Q. 7i, I think it is. It's a device that goes on your phone, and it has a microphone, and it is going to make for a better sound. So the, the main weak link on the phone is the actual microphone, mm -hmm. and this improves the microphone. Oh, yeah, IQ7 mm -hmm. is the Zoom version. But there are many versions. I picked that one because I, I think it looks cool. I haven't tried it. I, uh, years ago, I used a blue version, but that's with the old iPhone. It doesn't actually work with my new iPhone anymore. 
this gives you a better sound. It's still portable, it's small. You can carry it with you, but you can also have it handy on your desk. I think they all come with some kind of software so you can actually record and then overdub. So you can record a rhythm and then play a melody or That's sing cool. over it. They all come with this kind of multi-track hmm. software. At least at least the Zoom one does. I think the other ones also come with it. Oh, if yeah. not, there's a, a band in the box on the iPhone. You can always use that. Oh, I've never heard no, of it. No, not band in the box. It's a garage band. That's oh, yeah, garage band. Garage yeah. band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a multi-track software that comes with the iPhone stuff. I don't know for Android what to use, but yeah. it's probably something. Mm -hmm. Now, um, they're about 100 bucks. There's, like I said, many brands. iRig is famous for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoom. There's uh, several versions. I think the uh, iQ7. There's the iQ9 that just has a little different microphone makeup. The, here's a, a concept I want to get across before I talk about the other things, too. What you're looking at is something we call an A to D converter. It's changing analog signal to a digital, digital signal. Right. So these, this A to D converter is in all the items I'm going to mention going forward. This is what you need to change whatever you have from a microphone into something that can be stored on a digital device. Got it. This, um, the Zoom thing has this built in, so it's changing it as it goes into the phone. The downside is anything attached to your phone is going to pick up the noise from the phone and any movement or touching and all that. So the noise factor, for me, it's, it's kind of a reference recording, but I wouldn't try to use it for anything. I'd have to get rid of some of that noise in the background if I were going to use it for like a lesson or something like that. That said, I'll, I'll still do it for a quick lesson just to show somebody something, but not for something I'm going to use over and over. The next level above that well, now I think they're not really another level, but they're all kind of combined. You can either get a box that has the A to D converter built in, and it has an input for a microphone, input for headphones, and goes from there into your computer. Mm -hmm. Now you have to have a computer handy to make this work. The box actually does the conversion, but then stores it in your computer. And you can manipulate your computer. You can, they often do come with software that you can do that multi-track recording. When I say multi-track, the main benefit for a guitar player is to record a rhythm and then maybe play something over it, like a melody or mm -hmm. some, another rhythm. Yeah. Uh, one popular brand is the PreSonus. I had one of these. Uh, it came with some software. I think it was a, a low version of Sonar back in the day. It was years ago. And it has an input for a couple of microphones. You, you want to have an input for headphones because when you're multi-tracking, you, you can track one time and listen to it. But when you listen back to play along with it, you have to play it through headphones because so you don't want what you're playing back to go back into the microphone yeah. and create a loop. So you have to have headphones. And then, of course, you're going to need a microphone cable go into the box. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good option. I think there's a little higher quality option that's... Um, I noticed on Sweetwater, it's not much more. Mm -hmm. It's called a Focusrite Scarlet. It's basically the same thing. It doesn't actually have an input for two mics. That's for one mic and a guitar. So it still lets two inputs, but not two those XLR inputs. But you can get a package on Sweetwater for a couple hundred bucks that has a Audio-Technica 2020 microphone mm -hmm. and the cable all for 200 bucks. If you buy the PreSonus for 100 bucks, and you buy a good mic, you got to have a, a decent mic. Uh, I'd recommend the AT2020. That's Audio Technica 2020. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm starting to talk to Lingo, excuse me. Uh, and you still need a cable. Now you're already over 200 bucks right there. I think it's 120 for the Audio Technica mic and another 20 bucks for a cable. So you're already over that 200 bucks there. The 200 buck package for the Focusrite with the cable and the microphone, it's, you're still going to save money. And I think. Uh, Focusrite's known for good quality equipment. I yeah. think it's a better, likely a better uh, converter. Yeah. A to D converter. Sounds like a good deal. Now, you can compare features. One might have a feature that you just absolutely want. I'm not aware of such a thing, but you can check on that. Yeah. The other thing, you are going to need to get headphones, and either of those, you're going to need to get headphones separate. If you get the PreSonus with a microphone, like an AT2020, if you already have a microphone, that might not be an issue. But if you buy that microphone, you're out 240 plus a headset. The focus yeah. right is 200 bucks plus a, uh, headphones. Now, the one other thing that you might want to consider, which is the way I went. I saved it for last, but it's actually my, I, I'd say if I had to pick one, it's my first recommendation. Audio-Technica makes a microphone called the AT2020 USB, I think, plus for some reason. I don't know what the plus means. But the USB means it has that A to D converter, A to D converter, 
analog to digital converter built into the microphone. And then it has a cable that goes into a USB port on your computer. Wow. Now, it has a couple controls on it. So you can plug in a headphone to the mic, control the volume in the headphone. You can also have control the volume on the microphone as it goes into the computer. It's 170 bucks. <laughs> Now, yeah, it is 30 bucks cheaper than the whole set, but the main reason I want it is I don't want all this equipment in my living room. I have my own studio with, you know, thousands of dollars worth of equipment. I don't want all these boxes and stuff in my, um, in my office, so to speak. Yeah. That the, it's a good microphone, it, the converter seems good, and it goes directly into my computer. That's all I need. I can talk into it, play into it. It's only one input. So if you want to like plug in your guitar and sing into a microphone, maybe the box is a better choice. Yeah. But if you want the simplicity, less to go wrong with less pieces, I think that Audio Technica AT2020 USB Plus. Is it Plus? Yeah, USB Plus. And again, I don't know what the Plus stands for, but um, I've had mine for years and it works great. I'm wondering, Eli, if you if you have any tips on this. Eli is also like a sound guy and audio engineer guy, and say everything Thomas said is dead on. Those cool. USB mics are fantastic. Really good way to um, yeah make it easier for yourself not having to deal with the extra equipment. Also, that Scarlet unit. I, I know a couple people that have gotten those. You know, just for like reference recordings, things like that. They sound really awesome oh, and good. $200 price point yeah you're not really going to beat that so it's a great way to get started mm -hmm. of course it's not you know kind of like thomas said if you're going for something really professional or something like that like a cd recording or something you're going to release to the public you might want to go with something a little you know upgrade a little more go to a studio or something like that but if you're trying to do reference recordings for yourself or to post videos online or something these mics are fantastic mm -hmm. awesome thank you good hope that helps richard yeah um, we do have a couple more online live questions. Great. Um, before we do our raffle. So SR is back. SR raffle says, coming. in finger picking songs, how do you pick the bass note quickly for F bar chord? I mean, how do you quickly switch from F bar chord to pick the bass note? Um, so if you're finger picking the song. F. F bar chord. I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I guess it depends on where you're coming from, and if you're playing a bar chord F, or if you're playing the partial bar F, you're short on a bar, a bass note. I prefer the bar for that particular thing, but um, if you're finger picking, I often will do this version. It's kind of a, it's an F major seven, but it gets me that bass note without playing a bar. Uh, it depends on the song, if it fits or not. But other than that, I'm not sure it's kind of not enough information to answer it right. clearly. Please, tell me more when you say... And they say, I can do quick F bar for strumming, but it's difficult for finger picking. So I'm wondering if that means your chord isn't coming out clearly. And it could be also that you're saying it's hard to get that bass note because the first thing you hit in the finger picking with the bass note is the bass note. When you're strumming, that's not such an issue. You can, you can deaden out the bass note and still sound good. I have students practice at a certain level switching from C to F and playing the bass note first. So mm -hmm. the exercise is bass, drum, bass, drum, bass, drum. I call it from the bottom up. Right. Getting to the habit of hitting the bass note first. And for just that reason, if you're finger picking or you're playing any kind of style that uses the bass note, you want to play that and you've got a fraction of a second to get the rest of the notes down. Right. So the exercise is C, bass, play to F, bass. And you go as slow as you need to until we can get the bass note and keep picking it up. I use a metronome for practice. Yeah, good. Um, and SR, if you're here, uh, please put in the comments if, you, if that wasn't quite the answer you were needing. Um, we have DJ, DJ Chakra says, can you give any tips for learning Neon and Stop This Train by John Mayer? Um, I've been learning it for uh, two months. Are you familiar with the idiot no. songs? Okay, so no, I couldn't help with that. Let me think. Neon, neon. <laughs> okay, so somewhere around there. Um, let's see. Okay, so those are like the chords somewhere around there for neon. Um, whenever I'm not that familiar with the songs, my tip though is. Uh, 
if you listen to what we were saying earlier, make sure it's at a level that you can understand. There's a that's my first concern that yeah. came up is is that really what you should be working on? And right. if that's absolutely what you want to work on, you just have to bang away at it. Find YouTube videos that teach it. I was about to say um, find a YouTube video. There's a great website that I love, love, love called Cortify.net. Um, it's like my favorite because you can search the song and it has live grids and so you can actually play along with it and it'll have like the chords showing exactly what you need to be playing. Um, so maybe check out that. I would recommend, like you said, check out a couple YouTube videos, take your time with it. Make sure that you understand the chords. If the treble is transitioning from chord to chord, there's lots of tips on that. Um, and I know we've spent several times in RGS Lives talking about how to practice going from chord to chord. Um, so that's something to kind of think about. That's that's probably the most of my tips that I can think of. Okay. Yeah. Is are we ready for the raffle? Or um, is there another I think question? we just have one last question. Yeah. This will have. I saw to be, that move. <laughs> yeah, this will have to be the last one for today. Um, is from Jim. Is it acceptable to play the D chord using fingers two, three, four if you have short fingers? Um, a D, it's easier to use the fingers mentioned. Yeah. It's, it's harder for me, but I actually use this. That's why I went right to it, because I want sometimes a good bass note, and I'll play it this way, and then I can play this F sharp on the sixth string second fret, and I get a bass note. Yeah. Especially with finger picking, I like that F sharp. Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. So uh, another possibility, by the way, is you could do a little partial bar and then play like that. I understand what you're saying. You're, you're having a hard time getting these fingers in there. You could do a little partial bar. So I'm covering the first finger on the second fret over these three strings and then the second finger on the second string. So I don't have to try to get all these fingers in there. The problem with the D chord is you have to cram a lot of fingers in there. Yeah, yeah. By the way, sometimes I start students, depending on how thick their fingers are and, and how coordinated they are, I'll start them with a form of D chord. I call it a D sus two. It's just like D, but no second finger. So it's like this. Bass note's the fourth string, and it leaves the high E open. That makes it the sus two. It doesn't work in all songs, but some songs yeah. it sounds even better. Yeah. It's kind of an exotic form of D. It's a good chord in and of itself, and it's sometimes it's a good stepping stone to the full D. Exactly. Get you can also language. get a wider neck guitar if you're having a problem with this. I have a blog post, maybe we can, I could remember to link mm -hmm. to it. There's ways to deal with things if people have thick fingers. Some people get a 12 string guitar and just put six strings on it, which makes the neck a little wider and the distance between strings a little wider. Yeah, distance. definitely. Cool, I think it's about time for a raffle. I think there was one last, last, last question. Yeah, no problem. Um, this is from Nutty. Nutty says, hey, Hi, Nutty. I have a question. What's the best way to make alt rock indie, ri indie rock lit? Ah! Let me try that again. I have a question. What's the best way to make alt rock indie rock riffs like the Beatles and like the Strokes? How do you make riffs that sound like theirs? <laughs> I, I, if, I'd say if you want to learn Beatles riffs and and then alter them and make them your own. I mean, That's what, I what most you. of us guitar players do is we copy other people and then venture off into our own cut with that kind of a bass. Yeah. You know, a good place to start with that would be, like you said, learn, learn like a riff or two that you like. And then in terms of making them your own, see if you can change the key of them. It's so like just do the same riff. Start. It's a good place to start. See if you Trying can move the riff key. into a different key. Um, and then try playing the riff, like maybe if it's like a major sounding riff, try and make it a minor sounding riff. Just like start playing around with it that way so that way you can get this, the styling of that it. That sounds like fun to me. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about it. I'm like, oh, that'd be kind of fun. I kind of want to do something like that. I like to, one of the practice I like to do, and I don't know if this will help you, but for everybody out there, if you can record chords, play the riff over a chord. Mm -hmm. And that makes it, for me, a lot more fun, especially when you start adding kind of a chord progression, like uh, happy birthday. Mm -hmm. Play the riff of the G chord. On your tape record, and then play the riff over it. Now we can move it up to a C chord. And that's a C chord. And then back to the G. By the way, I have a lesson on that riff if you're interested. <laughs> Very cool. I think it's time for a raffle. Okay, raffle. I Let's give away that Amazon gift card before I spend it. <laughs> Let's see. Can you tell the people what this is for? Once a month, 
I release a series of practice sessions. It's a practice session five days a week on different aspects, and I cycle through warm-ups, chords and strums, some theory lessons, some improvisation, I call it jam club, and students go through these exercises each week. They, the requirement is only to spend 10 minutes. Then if you like it and you want to spend more time, save it so you can come back at it. If not so interesting, you've been exposed to it, you, you, you've got some practice on it, move on to the next one. If you complete all of 20, let's see, 28, or four times seven, four times five, 20 exercises <laughs> in a month, you are automatically entered into the monthly raffle and we give it away at the, uh, at the live session each month. All so right, we've winner. got people in here and let's see who is we're going to pick today. It's Shulamit. Shulamit, you get another Amazon gift card. Congratulations. <laughs> Good job. You deserve it. All right. So that's it for today. Yep. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you again at least next month. We're doing this the first Tuesday of every month at mm -hmm. 12 noon California time. I'm not sure where, what that is where you guys are at, but yeah. um, you can always look it up. All right. See you again. Bye. Bye for now. Now let's do nee 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 nee.